When it comes to choosing a gaming mouse, two concerns are the weight and the cable. Many find they aim better with a lighter mouse, and if the cable isn't flexible enough, it can hinder their aim too. But Rosa is addressing both concerns with the Hyperflux mouse and pad combo, which includes the Mamba and the Firefly. And this is it, a wireless mouse without the battery, which could have added up to 29 grams. That's why this Mamba comes in at about 97 grams on my scales. And how did they do it? By replacing the battery with a super capacitor and pairing it with electromagnetic induction. That's a quote directly from their guide. I actually don't know how they did it. I don't need to though. With over 19 years in Quake and after testing over 100 mice, I'm just here to tell you if they succeeded. Short answer, yes, it's amazing tech. Basically the mouse gets its power through the pad, so you never have to charge it. But you do have to use the pad they include with it, which has a hard side and a soft side. Apparently, super capacitors have a longer life than batteries too, and shorter power up durations. If you're worried about lifting the mouse up, it's still able to get power about 5 centimeters above, which is about 2 inches. Also, the speed that you lift the mouse up, it should hold enough charge until you put it back down. It's meant to last about 10 seconds, depending how far away it is and maybe how long it's been on there. This actually makes me wonder why they didn't make the pad larger. It looks like the tech can handle it. The usable area is about 34.5 by 24 centimeters, which is about 13.5 by 9.5 inches. So while it's okay, I would have preferred a bit larger. Anyway, I had no trouble rocket jumping around, the mouse didn't lose power at all. So with all that in mind, now for the details of the mouse. If you've owned a Mamba before, you'll be familiar with this already. Basically, it's like a death adder with filled out curves. It's a flatter shape, and in my opinion, that makes it more comfortable. The Death Adder is one of the top large mice on the market, with curves for comfort and grip. So that puts the Mamba above it. It also has a favorite of mine, deeper comfort curves in the buttons. And now with Rose's new styling, with rubber grips on the side, just like on the Basilisk, it feels really good. But of course that's personal preference. The rest of the mouse is slightly textured plastic, so it feels smooth while giving some extra grip. And the mouse feet glide smoothly on both sides of the pad. Here's a close up of the cloth. It feels amazing, but it might have too much control for some people. And a close up of the hard side, which compared with other hard pads, actually has some control to it too. I was able to play on this side without changing my sensitivity, which is rare. I have to send this mouse back so I don't want to damage it, but I generally don't use hard pads because of the speed and because they tend to wear out mouse feet. Hopefully this one doesn't. Now to some measurements. It's about 6.4 centimeters at the grip area, 12.3 long, and about 4.2 high. From the side, we see a gradual slope of the buttons and high point in the middle. So this is a shape that can suit a lot of grip styles. Ideally, you want about 60% of your hand measurements, but if you factor in comfort, you could probably use it in palm grip with 18 to 20 centimeters. Claw, 18 to 22 and fingertip 18.5 to 22. Same as the Death Adder Elite, but it is a tiny bit wider because of how they flatten the curve, so you could go a bit larger. Here it is next to the Death Adder, Basilisk and Abyssus V2, obviously closest to the Death Adder. The cable which plugs into the pad can also be plugged into the mouse, and it's 1.8 meters long, and it's a flexible, smooth braid. It's just a bit stiffer close to the mouse, but I think that might be by design. In use, the sensor performs extremely well, no problem rocket jumping around as usual, and I can't make it spin out even when moving it as fast as I can. Even when tilting it on its side and slamming it down, it continues tracking. Zooming in for the sniper test, it tracks pixel by pixel and it does it smoothly. Tested at 1600 and also 400 dpi. Acceleration levels seem normal pretty much non-existent, and the same for deceleration. This testing isn't totally accurate of course, but I had no trouble with it. The lift-off distance is under a DVD on the cloth side, and about one DVD on the hard side. In the line test, I don't see any jitter, angle snapping or skipping. Lift-off movement is good and no sensor rattle. As usual, it's a top performance by arguably the top sensor on the market. Very happy with it and the Firefly mousepad. In the latency testing, tested against the Razer Death Adder Elite, the clicks are about the same in the reaction test, and also the bomb test. So I would say little to no lag there. Just to help confirm that, I filmed it on a 240Hz monitor at 1000 frames per second, and it looks like no difference. Again, none of these tests are totally accurate, but all three together make a pretty good case that there's no latency on the Hyperflux, so you don't need to worry about the wireless having a delay. Now to check the quality, here's a listen to the clicks.
For some reason on this copy, the left mouse button is a little loose. This does sometimes happen, it's unlikely going to be on all copies. So based on the right click, it has a good balance of being a sharp click without being too loud. No accidental clicks either. Mass 3 is medium height wise, quiet and a bit harder to press in as always. The wheel seems more suited to gamers who want noticeable steps. It's loud and not great for browsing, but the wheel tilting left and right is a great feature to have. The side buttons have a nice click and a good travel distance. Similar to the death adder, but I would say a bit nicer. The DPI buttons are out of the way on top, all good there. And the profile button is on the left, which is a bit harder to press in. Checking the build when tapping it, it sounds fine. But shaking it reveals the mouse wheel is a bit loose. Not too bad though. Again, that's going to change from copy to copy. It uses Razer's new software, and you can alter the buttons, but not the profile switch. But you can alter the tilt wheel. To add extra commands on the mouse, you can use the hypershift, but I kinda wish I had a dedicated button for this. As for commands, you've got keyboard functions, mouse functions, sensitivity, macro, switch profile, switch lighting, hypershift, multimedia, and more. It also has onboard profiles, so you should be able to set it up once and uninstall the software. But you could lose some features, so it's probably best to keep it on there. The DPI stages go from 100 to 16,000 in steps of 50, and you can have five of those. Usual polling rate, and in lighting, you can set the brightness and change the power indicator color. Razer Chroma Studio is one of the easiest color configurators to use. You can make your own gradients with a few extra options for each device, or you can choose a preset. And in calibration, you can adjust the sensor to the mouse pad or change the liftoff height. But the change isn't much, so I would only recommend doing this if you're experiencing tracking problems. For most of this recording, I had the lighting set to normal. So here's what it looks like at full next to the death adder. And you can also see the smooth cycle lighting of the Firefly. Also, the weight distribution feels well balanced. In conclusion, it's impressive tech, and I love that Razer is pushing the boundaries and thinking outside the box. If the mouse suits your hand size and you want an RGB pad with a wireless mouse that doesn't require charging, this is a great choice, and it helps that it's even more comfortable than the Death Adder. But would I choose this over the Death Adder Elite? Well, there is one big problem with this combination, and that is the cost. In Australia, at the time of this review, it's $400. So for me, that's too much. It does seem cheaper in America. On Razer's site, it's listed at $250 USD, so we might see it lower on Amazon. If it hits the $200 mark, or even $220, then compared with the competition and what you get for this, I think it would be worth the money. But then there are a lot of people who want the latest and greatest out there, and right now, for what this is, it's pretty awesome. I'm happy to recommend it if it sounds like it suits you. Razer have done extremely well, and I hope we get to see the Razer Mamba as a standalone wired mouse someday, because I actually think this is better than the Death Adder Elite. As for gaming with it, and general use. I really enjoyed it. I played quite well, hit a lot of good shots, but it is too big for my hand size, so I would rather use something like the Abyssus V2, and also a bigger pad. So thanks to Rosa for sending it out for a review, and as always, no bias, I actually do have to send this one back. But if you want to help support the channel, I'll leave some links in the description. And as always, subscribe, like and share this video, and I'll catch you in the next.